right, so yesterday we talked about Democritus first. And um, that Democritus came up with the first idea that the atom existed, right? Democritus was just a philosopher. Um, the analogy we used with him was kind of like Legos. We just said, he kind of said that all atoms have different shapes and sizes. He said, well, all matter is made up of atoms, right? We call them atomless. And that different atoms of different substances have different shapes and sizes. But once you get to that point, you can't break it down any further. So that analogy was kind of like Legos. Where Legos are all different kinds of shapes and you can kind of stick them together in different ways to form compounds, things like that. But of course, that was 400 BC. So you know, Democritus didn't really have any technology involved. Um, it's just a thought process. It's, and he was up against Plato and Aristotle, whose opinion was that all matter is continuous. And that um, they just have that opposing view that you could keep breaking matter down. They were the more popular ones, so people more or less followed the Plato and Aristotle. So it wasn't until 1808 then that John Dalton stated his first atomic theory where we actually had some experimental evidence that the atom existed. We talked about those parts of the theory yesterday. Um, a lot of the experimentation that was going on at that time revolved around that ball conservation of the mass. So that's where people were carrying out, different scientists were carrying out uh, experiments in closed systems, realizing that whatever mass went into the reaction was the same mass that came out of the reaction. So there was no mass loss, even though it looks completely different, there's new substances being formed. It just changes forms, which led him to the fact that in chemical reactions, atoms just combine, separate, or rearrange. So he knew that all the atoms, the same atoms had to be there. They just rearrange themselves and Combined differently. That's how we got different substances. So basically, these two, three and four, um, revolve around the law of conservation of mass. Because he also said atoms cannot be created, destroyed, or subdivided. We know today that atoms can be subdivided, or atoms can be subdivided, right? We know that they're subatomic particles. At this time, he thought that atoms were smallest. Nothing was smaller. Of course, we couldn't have known about protons or electrons or neutrons yet. But we still believe this. We believe that eventually atoms come out of nowhere or atoms are just destroyed. They just rearrange themselves in chemical reactions. And then he also kind of updated his theory. I think it was like a year later. Years later, I don't know. I'm not going to test you on dates. Like I said, it's just kind of for reference so that you get an idea um, on a timeline when these things occur. So I'm not going to ask you for exact dates when these things happen, but I think it's interesting to keep in mind that 400 BC was the first idea that the atom existed, and it took 2200 years till we finally had evidence that the atom existed. So, very long time. But now, from this point on, you're going to see lots of discoveries happening in a short period of time. And five and six kind of go together as well. He said that when atoms combine, they combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. And the first thought of that was that if you had two elements that were going to combine, they thought they could only combine one way. Okay. But then he updated that and modified it because we realized that atoms can combine in different ratios, but when they do, they form completely different compounds. We used water and hydrogen peroxide as our example, but H2O and H2O2. Here's other ones like you know that carbon monoxide exists, right? Like 
carbon dioxide. What would be the formula for carbon monoxide? What does mono mean, carbon monoxide? Just one oxygen, right? So that would be CO, carbon monoxide. Carbon dioxide, how many oxygens would we have there? Two, right? So carbon dioxide would be another. They're completely different compounds though, right? Carbon monoxide is a whole lot more poisonous than carbon dioxide. So completely different compounds because they come together in different ratios. All right, so Dalton gave us a lot. And I just want you to keep in mind though that he was using, he was kind of bringing together a whole bunch of different experiments that people were doing into one theory. He didn't just do all the experimentation himself and come up with this theory on his own. He was gathering data from other people and putting it all together in a logical statement. Here's evidence that atoms exist. Okay. And mostly it was those experiments that were taking place in those closed systems okay, where they knew the mass going in was the same as the mass coming out, even though you had completely different substances in the end. Okay. That's where it all came together. So then as you go through, we're just going to kind of look at how different parts of the atom were discovered then. And based on your knowledge, what what are the three subatomic particles? And uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Right. And where are they found in the atom? Where are each of those? The electrons. What's that? The electrons. Right. So the electrons are on the outside part, right, in the cloud. And then where are the protons and neutrons? In the nucleus of the atom. So what do you think was probably discovered first? What would probably be the logical? The electron, right? Is on the outside. So the first person that gets credited basically for discovering things about the electrons is JJ Thompson. Just to give you an idea of where this is, this is all in chapter three of your book. Uh, your textbook, if you want to look back at all your pictures and things in there. So, J.J. Thompson um, is credited for discovering the electron. John Joseph Thompson, or something like that. Usually, just referred to as J.J. Thompson. And I will be showing you a video on this, but it's a little bit easier to see if you can visualize what he was doing and how he discovered um, the electrons. It just says late 1800s and 20s experiments, and it was 1897, I guess, when he actually had the support that showed from his experiments that the electron existed. So, so we had John Dalton, like 1808, 1810, somewhere in there, and a little bit of time went by, not 2200 years or so. 90 years went by, but a bunch of experimentation was happening in that time. I don't want you to think like nothing was going on for those 80 years or whatever. Um, but this is when he actually gathered enough experimentation and data that you could say there's something negatively charged. So what he used um, the experiments that he carried out were cathode ray tube experiments.
That's what allowed him to detect the electron. Um, cathode ray tubes are like the version of a cathode ray tube. Do you remember the old television sets that had big picture tubes in them and the old computer monitors that took up a whole desk because they had the big back to them before we had flat screens? Those are CRTs, those are cathode ray tubes. They're just glass tubes that are at real low pressure. Okay, they take most of the air out of them and um, have electricity behind them. Okay, so old televisions, old computer screens that had those big, have the whole big back to them before we had flat screens. Those were cathode ray tubes. Okay, they work a little differently than those cathode ray tubes, but same idea. Just a glass, closed glass tube that they run electricity through. And there's very little gas inside, so they're very low pressure inside. So basically, his cathode ray tube is fairly simple. A low pressure tube. And you did put different gases. Okay. So you had a small amount of gas inside that tube. And basically, he had electricity running through there. Cathode and anode, and he could hook that to an electrical source. And basically, he just did different experiments. He would um, run electricity through there. He had like a inside here, he had like a pinwheel type thing, like something that could roll through either direction. It's like artwork, not an artist. But just think of that as something that can roll on its own, either right or left, it's flat. So when he would put an electrical current through here, he always found that this free wheeler, thin wheeler, whatever, would always go away from the negative towards the positive. Okay. So that got him thinking there must be something negatively charged, right? That's pushing this thing away from the negative towards the positive, because we know that opposite charges attract, um, like charges repel, right? So it's being repelled away from the negative and, and towards the positive. Okay. Also, when you have a gas at low pressure like that, and you put electricity in there, different gases glow different colors. Okay. Like you're all familiar with neon lights, right? That's just neon gas inside a light bulb that's at low pressure. You run electricity through it, neon glows very bright red. Okay. <clears throat> Other gases glow different colors. I think argon is like a bluish color gas or whatever when it's when you put electricity through it. Okay. So he was also noticing the glow of the different gases that are going through there. This experiment. The other thing he did was if he put, you could see like a stream of electricity going through here. And if he would put like a magnet or another electrical force at that, like if he would put a positive magnet towards here, he'd find that this stream of electricity would be attracted to the positive. Okay. If you put a negative, magnetic force or electrical force outside the tube, he found that the beam would reflect away from the negative. So it's attracted towards the positive but away from the negative. Does that make sense? So all these things when he was using the cathode ray tubes, really what it came down to is he realized that there's something negatively charged in that.
and he knew that these particles were also extremely small. They had really low uh, mass. So what he got from these cathode ray tube experiments, something was very was negatively charged inside the atom. There were particles. particles. So something with particles that are negatively charged inside the atom. And they have a really high charge, but a really low mass. Okay, so in other words, they got a lot of punch for their size, right? So they're really, really tiny, but they give off a lot of charge for that size. And he came up with that actual ratio, like what the number would be, but he didn't know what the mass where the charge was. He knew the ratio between them. He came up with a, it's a really high ratio between the charge and the mass, a lot of charge for a little bit of mass, but he didn't know what either of those were. So, Another scientist came along and gave us a little bit more information about this electron, which was Robert Millikan. He did an experiment, it's an oil drop experiment, that actually determined the mass or the charge of the electron, I'm sorry, the charge of the electron, like how much charge it has. We already know it was negatively charged. We just didn't know how much charge it had. Okay, so he experimentally determined the actual magnitude of charge of the electron. And then once he got the charge, he could put that charge into J.J. Thompson's charge to mass ratio and determine the mass. So he experimentally determined the charge of the electron, like how much the magnitude of charge was. So you have the actual magnitude of charge, like how much negative charge does each electron have? So once he knew how much charge there was, then he could just plug that into J.J. Thompson's ratio, his charge to mass ratio, and could calculate what the mass is. And he actually came out to be very, very, very close to what we believe it is today. This was in 1909. So J.J. Thompson was detecting that the electrons existed Came up with the charge to mass ratio around 1897. Then, like 10 years or so later, Robert Millikan added to that information.
And I'll show you a video on both of these that explains. Uh, I know this is kind of dry, it's just a lot of information, but we just have to kind of go through and see how each experiment contributed to uh, our knowledge of this atom. So the experiment that he used was. Oil drop experiment. So JJ Thompson used the cathode ray tube experiments to determine that there was something small and negatively charged in the cathode. Robert Milliken added to that information with his oil drop experiment. And the way the oil drop experiment So you have a cylinder that basically has a top and a bottom, right? That's metal. And it has a middle plate kind of in the middle of it. And on that middle plate, there's a little hole in the center. Up here, he had a, what's called an atomizer that he put oil in. Do you, do you ever see those antique um, perfume bottles that have like a little bulb on them and it's a glass that has the perfume and you squeeze the bulb and the perfume comes out of this? That's what he was using. Okay. They call them atomizers, but it's just basically probably took his waste perfume bottle and put oil in the freezer. Because he wanted to have a fine mist of oil, he wanted really small. So he would spray the oil, give him a really fine mist. But he wanted to focus on these oil drops one at a time. So he didn't want them all coming down to the bottom chamber at once. So that's why he put this plate in the middle that has a little hole in the center. So only a few oil droplets would be able to come down every time he squeezed the capsule. And here, he can control the voltage. That's a little voltage controller here. So he can control how much electricity on this plate. This plate would be hooked up to electricity. This plate was just positive so that he'd have a current flowing through. He also had x rays into that atmosphere. Because what happens is, you know, when you get an x ray, it's pretty high energy, right? Like when you get an x ray, they just click it and you're done, right? They don't expose you to x rays for very long. It's very high energy in those sources. Well, that energy causes the gas that's in here, the gas in the environment, just the air, causes them to release electrons. So what happens is when an atom gains a lot of energy, and we'll learn more about this as we go on. When an atom gains a lot of energy, the electrons jump into higher energy levels. If they gain enough energy, okay, you had said that the electrons are in this electron cloud, right? The electron cloud, cloud is made up of energy levels. So if they gain a little bit of energy, they just, the electrons just jump into higher energy levels. And then they return and give off that amount of energy and light. That's how fireworks and things work. If you have really high energy like x-rays, the electrons jump so far that they actually jump off the atom. They don't, there's no energy levels remaining. They're beyond the energy levels. So x-rays, These x rays cause the air to release electrons. Okay. And then they're absorbed by these oil droplets that are in here. So these electrons that are released from the air get absorbed by the oil droplets that are falling down. Okay. So 
as these oil droplets come down and start going to that plate, they're absorbing these electrons that are released from the air because the X rays are coming through. And he's also got like a magnifier. So that he could look at each of these oil droplets. So they're really small. So he just used like a magnifier to, so he could see better. And he would adjust this electricity so that these oil droplets would just hover above the plate. He just put enough electricity that he would overcome the gravity that was pushing down because if these are absorbing electrons, they're negatively charged, right? So this. Is also negatively charged, so it's going to repel those droplets. Gravity comes down, right? Gravity always puts this down. Right? So the gravity is pushing the oil droplets down. The up, the light charges are repelling each other. That's what's pushing it back up. And he would adjust it until it was just hovering above the plate. So the oil droplet wasn't going up or down. And he kept writing those charges down. So every oil droplet was different because they weren't exactly the same size. So the data he was collecting, the collected data, was the amount of charge that each oil droplet contained. So whatever charge it took to make that oil droplet hover, he just kept writing that down over and over. Like this oil droplet took this much charge, this oil droplet took this much charge, this oil droplet took this much charge. They were all different in amount of charge because just spraying oil out of the atomizer isn't going to make all those drops exactly the same size. So they would all absorb a different number of electrons. Okay. So what he found was when he collected all these oil droplets, how much charge it took to make each drill oil droplet hover. The total amount of charge to make each droplet hover above the plate is always a multiple of the same number. It's always a multiple of the same number. So let's make a simple number. It wasn't a simple number, but let's just to make an analogy out of this. Let's say my first oil droplet, um, the amount of charge it took was 18. My second oil droplet, let's say that total charge to make it hover was 22. The next one was 12. The next one was 16. Keep taking my data. This is the amount of charge it takes to make each oil droplet hover. What are all those numbers a multiple of? Two, right? We can see that they're all multiple of two. So I might say, oh, you know what? I think it'll, I think one electron has a charge of two. So this oil droplet must have had nine electrons in it. This oil droplet must have had eleven electrons in it. This oil droplet must have had like six electrons in it. This one had eight electrons because they were all different size electrons. That's the logic he was using. So he just kept taking data over and over and over, finding out how much voltage it took to make those oil droplets hover, and said, you know what? This, these are all a multiple of this number. So one electron must have this amount of charge. 
number, whatever they were a multiple of, that was the charge of one electron. Then you could take that charge, put it into J.J. Johnson's charge to mass ratio, and determine the mass of the electron. Okay? But that was his experiment. That was important. Okay. Any other questions? So it was kind of the two of them together that gave us most of the information about the um, Now, we've been putting a model up with each one, like Democritus would kind of use Legos for a modern day model. John Dalton is a billiard ball because he thought atoms were the smallest thing, right? So they, he had the more spherically shaped, but just bigger or smaller spheres depending on the element. Now we have to add charge to the atom. So what J.J. Thompson basically came up with was this model. He called it the plum pudding model, but he was also English where they ate plum pudding. Okay, we don't, I don't know how many people eat plum pudding. So what plum pudding is, is it's basically a pudding that has raisins in it, okay? So the raisins would be the electrons and the pudding would be this positive mass. But if, they're, if there's something negative in the atom, there has to be something positive there to hold it in, right? Otherwise, why would it stay in there? So I think we could get a better visual If we call it the chocolate chip cookie dough model. So the dough would be your positive mass, and the chocolate chips are all distributed through there, right? Those are those would represent your electrons. Now that's not what we believe the atom looks like today, but that was his model at the time. So we have this big positive mass would be he thought it was the positive mass holding these electrons to it. So he referred to it as the plum pudding model. You would probably better visualize it as the chocolate chip cookie dough model. So we don't need plum pudding. That was a common dish at that time in England and English scientists. So it makes sense that he called it. Question. So we're going to stop there. I'll find that video. The videos on JJ Thompson and Milliken. They're real short videos, and we'll start off tomorrow with that as kind of a review of these things. That'll help you visualize their experiments a little bit better. Right? I mean, you got my drawing and everything on there, but the video might help you a little bit more. So we'll watch those. We'll start off tomorrow. I do want you to know, though, in 1909, he came very close with this calculation once he calculated the mass of the electron. It was extremely close to what we still believe the mass of the electron to be. So, pretty simple experiment, right? It wasn't really a high tech experiment. It was still under with some electricity, gas in there with some oil droplets, and some x rays to get the electrons to absorb. Okay. Not real high tech. And it took a lot of him just visualizing to see how much energy, how much electricity is going to be exploded on this one. So I found pretty much information on pretty simple experiments. But where this is going to lead them is scientists now wanted to know 
well, what is that positive mass ratio? You found out there's something negative in there, or there's something positive in there holding it together. What are those positive things? Or where does that positive charge come from? So, experiments then rolled from that. Okay.